All right, so I'm Luke, and uh, I'm a relative newcomer to the Rust community. I've been using Rust for about a year. Um, I'm coming to you from the Elm community, where you know there's a lot of conceptual overlap between the type systems and what have you, but there's also a lot of stuff that's really different. And uh, so I'm really enjoying learning and uh, uh, using Rust. I'm happy to be here. Um, and uh, today, I want to tell you about how I used Rust to become extremely offline. If you aren't familiar with the term, it's a, it's a reference to being extremely online, which is a, a jokey expression for when you spend so much of your time and energy on the internet that it becomes a self-consciously important part of your life. And so what I've been trying to do is sort of the, the opposite of that, where I'm only using the internet when I need to in more of like a utilitarian fashion. So of course for work and for things like watching TV or finding guitar tabs or, you know, messaging uh, family and friends, that kind of thing. And so the, uh, the logical next question here would be, why would you want to do that? You know, especially with the pandemic, more and more of, of life is moving onto the internet. And why would you want to back away from that uh, in that way? And I will tell you, so around 2017, I had reached a point with my internet usage habits where I was no longer just distracted by browsing. I was spending too much time and investing too much emotionally in what I encountered online. And it transitioned from just merely a distraction to a serious and potent source of anxiety. And my internet habits were not just affecting me at this point, they were also impacting the people that I love and my responsibility to them. And so with very patient help from friends and family, I confronted the situation and decided the best thing for me to do would be to, to log off and, and leave it all behind uh, to the extent that I possibly could. So step one of this journey was the, the classic deleting social media accounts. And uh, I don't actually have a lot to say about that. I'm glad that I did it and that I had the option to do it. I don't really miss it, um, but it, it turned out to just be kind of a surface level fix. It wasn't really the the posting and the follower accounts that was getting to me. It was uh, a much more pernicious underlying habit um, that you can pick up while you use social media. And that is doom scrolling, right? It means scrolling through doom. It's uh, the thing where you kind of endlessly swipe through your timeline and kind of inundate your brain with, you know, the day's evidence of humanity's real capacity for cruelty. And uh, it feels awful to do. But uh, for some reason, it's also really addictive. And breaking this habit has taken a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of creativity. And I'll tell you how I, how I went about it. So I had deleted my social media accounts, but all of the timelines that I scrolled through are, are still public. So I had to, uh, in order to, to cut that off, I had to take kind of a drastic step and I got a site blocker. Right. The one I chose is called Cold Turkey, and it's a very good piece of software. I highly recommend it if you're interested in, in that kind of thing. And uh, the creator is really nice about answering my emails. And um, how it works is it blocks URLs by pattern using a browser extension. And then it's got uh, anti-circumvention features where if you try to disable it or uninstall it, a separate process detects, detects that and uh, will close the browser to annoy you into not doing that anymore. And uh, so I used cold turkey to block social media timelines. And then over the course of a couple of years, one by one, I went and I blocked all of the news outlets that pr were producing these doom filled headlines in the first place. And uh, so now as of this year, I built up a fairly comprehensive ban list in cold turkey that blocks all of the news sites that I've come across that I would really care to browse. And uh, it's good progress, and I'm really proud of the, the point that I was able to reach with that approach. Uh, but it left one problem still on the table, and that's the, the search engine. Okay, so I'm a programmer, and uh, I have to use a search engine for work. I have to use a search engine to do anything useful. <laughs> and uh, so I, I'll come over here, and uh, you know I'll search for some info on the problem that I'm working on, and look for some docs, and I'll, I'll get some results. But uh, I'm always tempted to come back to the search bar and maybe search for some doom-laden topic. And uh, search engines now, they recognize when you've typed in something news-relevant, and they'll show you this 
like interstitial content within the results, you know, latest headlines or popular social media posts or related videos or what have you. And uh, this little list of, of headlines here, even though the sites underneath them are, are blocked in, in all likelihood um, or are of, of no interest, I, I still find that just seeing the headlines is actually enough to get into this loop uh, of negative feedback where I'm typing in the news and I'm getting anxious at the headlines and then I go back up and I type in climate change and I get even more anxious and it goes on like that until the whole day is over and I'm sitting here just like shaking with rage and anxiety and I'm in a terrible mood and I got nothing done. Uh, but cold turkey can't help here as of the current version uh, because it only blocks URLs and not content within a page that you still want to access. All right, so what do we do? What do I do here? Uh, well, I'm a programmer and recently I'm a web programmer, so I know how to build a browser extension that can take care of this. Um, and it actually doesn't take much. All right, so we've got a few lines of JavaScript here and we'll take the document and search for the distracting content on the page using a CSS selector. And uh, then for each element, just hide it. Simple as that. And uh, we take that and we put it inside of the mutation observer, which is a web API that invokes a callback whenever content on the page changes. And so that covers the initial page load, and it also takes care of uh, subsequent updates in a single page app kind of scenario. And uh, it totally works, right? We'll come over here and enable the extension and uh, you know come back to the search page and uh, you know, we'll search for the news again, and we'll see that the content is, is no longer visible. And that's good, that's great. But if it's that easy to go up there and search for a distracting topic, it's just as easy to quickly go over to the corner and remove the extension if the temptation is strong enough, right? So it doesn't really work if you can just turn it off. Um, some argue that the same is true of type systems. I don't wanna get involved in that in that discussion too much. Um, okay, so we need uh, what we need to do is implement the, the same anti-circumvention features that Cold Turkey has, and we're gonna do it with Rust. All right, so here's what we need to build. Okay, so we've got the extension JavaScript running in the browser, and browser extension APIs have this feature called a native messaging host that Let's JavaScript communicate with a pre-installed native binary over standard I.O. And the browser starts that native binary in a subprocess and manages its lifecycle along with the extension. All right, so that allows, uh, that allows us to communicate directly with the extension through another program. All right, so we're going we're gonna to build a daemon that uh, will periodically ask the extension if it's enabled. And... Uh, if the browser fails to respond through the native messaging hosts or it responds with something unexpected or incorrect, um, then the daemon is going to shut down the browser. And again, you know, it'll annoy me into not doing this anymore. All right, so let's, uh, let's check out some of this code here. Let's get into it, starting with the daemon. Um, so this program is trying to, to decide to do one of two things, you know, close the browser or leave it open. And the first step we need to take is to make sure that we have a, a PID for the browser, process ID. Um, if we can't find one, that means the browser isn't running. So we can just exit without worrying about it. We don't care. Um, if we do find one, we're gonna hold on to it because we'll need it if we have to close the browser later. All right, then we're gonna be coordinating a couple of things concurrently and we're gonna use threads and we're gonna use a channel to do that. Um, channels are good for this because uh, you can clone the sender you can move it into a closure. You can uh, coordinate. You can uh, communicate between between threads this way, um, or maybe not between threads, but you can coordinate what threads are, are trying to accomplish. Um, in this case, so uh, first thing we got to do is set up communication with the native messaging host. Um, kick off the thread, and then we'll connect to the hosts over IPC inter process communication. Uh, then we send a message that just says ping. We're going to wait for a response, and if we get that response back and the response is Pong, we're all good. We're going to tell the channel we don't want to close the browser, and if anything else comes back, you know, malformed input or unrecognized input, we're just going to 
tell the tell the tell the uh, the program to go ahead and, and close the browser. And uh, so at the same time as we're doing that, we're also going to start another thread, and we're going to immediately suspend it for 20 seconds. And in that 20 seconds, if that 20 seconds elapses without a response from the native messaging host, we're going to push an outcome onto the channel to close the browser because it's timed out. And uh, we don't think it's ever going to respond. Um, and so now the last thing that we have to do is wait for something to appear on the channel. And once something does, if we're, if we're told to close the browser, then we'll use the browser PID that we got earlier to shut it down. And uh, either way, the daemon's work at this point is, is finished. So we'll exit. All right, so that gives us the daemon. Let's now take a look at the native messaging host side of this. Um, there's not a whole lot going on here. It's just a proxy between the daemon and the browser itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to accept incoming IPC connections. Uh, the native message host runs continuously, whereas the daemon will run once and exit. Right? So we're, we're accepting one connection after the next uh, over time. And for each one that comes in, we'll await a request. And if the request is ping, then uh, we're going to move forward and proxy that up to the browser. And then when we receive a response from the browser sometime later, we're going to check it out. We're going to see if it says Pong. And if this function here returns true, then we will send Pong back to the daemon so that it can finish up. Uh, pretty, yeah, pretty, uh, pretty simple. It's just a proxy. Um, and then finally, we're going to close the circuit here. Right, so the JavaScript side also needs to communicate with the, uh, with the native messaging host. And uh, to do that, we've just got to throw in a couple more lines of JavaScript. So we're going to use the browser's API to connect to the, to the host. We're going to wait for our requests. When a request comes in, we first need to ask if we, the extension is enabled in private browsing. At this point, we know everything else is enabled just because the code is running, but we do have to ask this of the browser at runtime. So if we get a, uh, an acceptable response there, um, if everything looks good, we're going to send Pong back down to the native messaging host. The native messaging host is going to send it back to the daemon, which will exit uneventfully. And uh, if anything should go wrong in there, if it should take too long, or if uh, the response is incorrect, or you know any other kind of failure, failure happens, uh, the, uh, the daemon is going to assume that it happened because I tried to circumvent the system and uh, it's going to close the browser and annoy me into not doing that. And uh, I'm really pleased to say that this, this does work both uh, technically and uh, you know psychologically or, or however you want to put that. Um, it, uh, it has the intended effect. So uh, if I come over here and uh, the temptation is just so overwhelming, I go and I just I, I remove the extension. I can't take it. Um, that the daemon's going to execute and the browser will close. And, uh, you know, in reality, the daemon is, is running once every 10 seconds. I don't have to do it manually, but um, uh, yes, it, it works. And uh, I, I would say at this point that I, I feel like I've achieved the goal of at least becoming like pretty offline, if not extremely so. So uh, yeah, I'm thrilled with this. It was a great opportunity to learn Rust. And I just want to wrap up here first by shouting out some of the crates that I used. So there's psutil for getting the PID, interprocess for, for IPC, libc for closing the browser, and then surty and byte order for communicating with the extension from the messaging host. And then I want to uh, plug that I work at Struction Site. We're building project tracking tools for the construction industry, and we use a lot of Rust, and we're only going to be using more. Right? We've got a server, we've got processing jobs, and now we've even got uh, front-end code that we've built with Rust and compiled to WebAssembly. And uh, we've also used Elm for our user interfaces. So if any of that sounds interesting, you can head to uh, structionsite.com slash careers and check out the positions we've got open. Uh, and feel free to, to reach out to me as well. And then lastly, uh, here are some places that you can reach me. You know, feel free to send me an email, or you can find me on GitHub. Uh, and if you like to play chess, you can find me at chess.com. 
Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, I'm really honored to be able to, to speak at RestConf this year, and I, I hope you enjoyed this.